is really happening. I just need like a moment to, to soak this. Okay. Zodiac is a 2007 film from David Fincher adapted by James Vanderbilt based on the book by Robert Graysmith. I'm going to go out on a limb here, but I'm going to give the lion's share of the Masterworks credit to Fincher and the original text by Graysmith because Vanderbilt's writing credits are, well, I mean, both of the amazing Spider-Man douche hoses and White House down. Wait, what the f*** is Independence Day 3? We didn't even get a 2 yet, so don't give me Independence Day Resurgenancers. Who am I kidding? I'd watch it. 2007 is one of those years where huge actors had just started to peek over the surface of their incoming super fame. Just to quickly run down the embarrassment of riches that are in this movie, it features, in build order, Jake Gyllenhaal, Mark Ruffalo, Anthony Edwards, Robert Downey Jr., yes, he was the fourth build. Brian Cox, Chloe Sevigny, Elias Codius, who has now appeared in two episodes because that's my boy Casey Jones, dog. Dermot Mulroney, Philip Baker Hall, that dude who plays in McPoyle on Always Sunny. Perfect for you, and if you like. That kid that played Minkus on Boy Meets World, Jack's dad from Lost. I could probably run with that joke just on this one movie for, for a couple more minutes, actually. I mean, it's basically just the CBS Killer of the Week best of showpiece. Anywho. There are a lot of reasons to love this movie. We could start with cinematography by the great Harry Savides, who'd worked with Fincher before on Seven, but actually not as a cinematographer. Harry is actually the guy that shot the opening credits. Um, he also shot Fiona Apple's Criminal and the supremely underrated other Fincher film, The Game. And what's crazier, other than the staggering frequency with which career-defining shots find their way into this film, uh, it was one of the first movies to be shot almost entirely digitally. It used the Thompson Viper film stream camera, and this was one of the first films shot digitally that really started to get people to look at this emerging technology and take it seriously. I think part of that was the lenses that Zodiac was shot on uh, and how they were used, how it was lit, how wide the aperture was. Because um, Fincher likes to shoot with with the aperture like wide open, uh, which really helped with a lot of the early digital technology. Because the lower the light levels, the more crap the results are with those original cameras. And what what's interesting is all the other films that were shot on this specific camera and model uh, are so much more obviously not shot on film. Like Collateral, one of the movies uh, and it's a good movie. It just looks like a toddler took a sweet hot dump in that Panavision magazine on the top. But if you like causing trouble up in hotel rooms, if you like having secret little rendezvous, but did you know? It wasn't until the 2009 Academy Awards that a digital film won for Best Cinematography. Uh, it was for Slumdog Millionaire, uh, and I, I had this whole joke where I was going to shame the, the list of films that were nominated in cinematography, because they didn't even nominate Zodiac, and I was like, I'm going to get them, but uh, and yeah, now that I look it up, I mean, what a hell of a list. And the great irony here is that Zodiac is entirely about the coming of that digital age with murders taking place in multiple precincts where all the evidence is either wholly disconnected or circumstantial. It's only after 20 years that Robert Graysmith was even able to put it all together. I remember when this film came out, despite pretty generally favorable reviews, there were complaints about the lack of resolution as it pertains to who the Zodiac Killer actually was. <sighs> and just because the last comment section was ripe with this hot garbage, Ted Cruz was born in 1970, the first Zodiac killing was 1968. Yes, I understand it was a joke when you said it. Please shut up about Ted Cruz forever now. For Ted Cruz. Pay for by Ted Cruz. Going back, this movie is not about neat and tidy endings. In fact, it's completely a commentary on the opposite. While the book by Graysmith it's based on is a more fact-based account of all relevant information, the film is thematically about the reality of solving a murder case. It reads between the lines of Graysmith's account and creates a protagonist that is so blindly driven by his own obsession with finding out the truth about who Zodiac is that he will sacrifice anything, including his marriage. Admittedly, he wrote the book on this, but if you double-check the facts that this movie presents, all of them check out with the official records. Yeah, I have uh, I've been stockpiling research since I put this up for vote the first time, um, and I too became pretty obsessed with doing a piece on this movie eventually, which is kind of meta that, like, obviously I was obsessed with Zodiac, and the people in Zodiac are obsessed with Zodiac. And the only thing that this movie completely made up doesn't really matter anyway, but it's the fact that Gray Smith and writer Paul Avery uh, were friends, because in real life they were not that at all. But their friendship in the film, which I do think strengthens the overall narrative, uh, it does lead to one of the greatest comedic edits I've seen in a long time. I wouldn't make fun of it if you tried it. But 
who actually cracked the code. And needless to say, the editing in this film was flawless. But what enamors me so much more about it is how blissfully this film shifts genres at the drop of a hat, like comedy to family drama to horror to police procedural to... But if you like causing trouble up in hotel rooms, if you like having secret little rendezvous... And that could mean that this film is a mess, but it's really anything but. To put the audience in the correct mindset of paranoia and fear, the original murders are filmed in two different ways. For First in slow motion, fetishizing the kill as you would in a horror movie, but the second murder is filmed matter-of-factly, like a documentary. They both attempt to emotionally connect you to the victims so that it can slowly wither that connection away over the course of the film. You're supposed to desperately know the necessity of finding and stopping the killer so that you feel and understand what the police and media investigating the murders went through. It's pissing you off on purpose. This is real cop shit. You don't get resolution, you get disappointed. And at some point, they all moved on, except for Graysmith, because Graysmith just happens to be the right kind of Looney Tunes. But if you like causing trouble... Mr. Graysmith is a man driven by details, which is funny because when you understand the lengths Fincher went to to recreate the case as close to reality as possible, they're really the same kind of Looney Tunes. But if you like... Of immediate importance to this that those... Two murders I brought up weren't actually the Zodiac's first killing. They were his second and third. This is important because those second and third murders both had a survivor at the scene to reconstruct everything as closely as possible through a first-hand account. The first killing, which killed two, had no survivors, so the movie doesn't bother showing it to the audience. You just hear about it. Because this movie really adds up to one simple truth. But if you like causing trouble up in hotel rooms, if you like having secret little When circumstantial evidence, which mind you are verifiable and proven facts about the case, they just aren't really admissible because it's, well, circumstantial. But when these are added together, and even in the light of the already existing disqualifying admissible evidence, when this circumstantial data, like the fact that the primary suspect in the case lied on the record about being ambidextrous, for example, which would remove his main disqualifier being a suspect because handwriting is the thing that cleared him twice. Also, the handwriting guy who disqualified him was a high-functioning alcoholic at the time, uh, which is extra hilarious because that evidence is also circumstantial, and that's really the connective tissue of this movie. All Graysmith cares about in the world is figuring out who the Zodiac Killer is and looking that person in the face, in the eyes, because then he'll know for sure. He says exactly that to his wife right before she leaves him. Be serious. I am serious. I... I need to know who he is. I, I need to uh, stand there. I need to look him in the eye. And I need to know that it's him. The film's climax is not a chase through the pouring rain, firing shots off between our protagonist and villain. In, in, in fact, the villain is only talked about in the climax because the scene takes place over a breakfast between a cop that walked away from the case and the cartoonist that couldn't. And Gyllenhaal's great in this scene. All circumstantial evidence from the entire film is laid out end to end as it pertains to a suspect that was cleared on the basis of handwriting from a drunk. And it asks us the question, what is the likeliness that the person listed in the police report from another county by only a first name is the same person as the suspect they like for the Zodiac based solely on their own circumstantial evidence? If those two people are the same person, then they got him. They just can't prove it circumstantially, which is exactly what Gray Smith does right here. Darlene Farron worked at the Vallejo House of Pancakes on the corner of Tennessee and Carroll. Arthur Lee Allen lived in his mother's basement on Fresno Street, door to door. That is less than 50 yards. Is that true? I've walked. There's no way that he didn't know the first victim because they lived 50 yards away and there's multiple accounts of him walking in and out of that restaurant. But it's circumstantial. Which the film connects back thusly. Since the evidence they had would never hold up in court, Graysmith writing the book was important to try the person that they were positive was the Zodiac Killer in the court of public opinion. Finish the book. Graysmith's book, upon release, caused quite a stir, enough that the police decided to reopen the case with the person the book and the film are based almost entirely around. And that person is Arthur Lee Allen, a man that Robert Graysmith looks directly in the eyes at the end of the film, bringing his story and ours to a close. This is the close of his emotional journey. He did it. He solved it for himself. And here's the most important piece of circumstantial evidence in a movie that's piled wall to wall with the stuff. When the police came to question on Arthur Lee Allen, reopening his involvement with the case, 
he promptly died of a heart attack. The Zodiac Watch, the background of school children, the misspellings of Christmas, bloody night. All circumstantial. Exactly. This film defies genre, defies traditional plot structure, defies everything you've ever learned about character arcs and development. It mixed wholly opposing genres, uh, something a documentary on the subject could never do. It gave us very real character interactions that shine a light on things about our own behavior that a drama just couldn't do because this movie simply lacks any type of resolution. This movie simply is. It's an exploration of the darkest aspects of humanity with the scariest and most impending threat withering away into a joke. As a Zodiac killer, he's terrifying. As Arthur Lee Allen, he's a sexual predator that stole his logo from a wristwatch he was dumb enough to wear when he talked to the cop. It's Be nice. all circumstantial. It's a beautiful celebration of the color yellow used to show the boom of the late 60s and early 70s in San Francisco. But it also represents the growing fear of the people around Robert. Pay attention to how much yellow is used when the Zodiac is writing letters to the papers, when he is posting his most immediate threat. As he becomes a memory over the years, so too does the color yellow fade from our palette. It's legitimately effective as a horror movie, as a thriller, and hilariously, there's a scene later in the film, I think it might only be in the director's cut actually, where Gray Smith goes to investigate another suspect and his own paranoia turns a person who was never even under suspicion into a person that he runs away from like a frightened cartoon cat. Huh. At that point, Robert just sees the Zodiac everywhere because no one else is seeing Zodiac anywhere. <laughs> It may all be circumstantial. Be nice. All circumstantial. Come on, Ruffy, don't don't do me like that. I you just heard I just said that. Be nice. All circumstantial. Oh, okay, okay. You you take five. Here's the ten. Go to Chipotle and just like pound that down your your gulp tube there. And 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 really, I, I need you like at a three um, when you come back because like all day you've been like at a nine. So like, but if, if, if you like COVID, if, if, if trouble up in hotel rooms, if you like I know this review has tried to talk about like 90 different things, none of them anywhere near the depth they should be talked about, sort of like a goose with a fine collection of hypodermic needles, but that's honestly just the type of film that it is. Uh, you ever read that review of a film, you know, it, yeah, I'm sure you've seen it, it's like, it's where the reviewer is like, honestly, this film just tried to do too much. That's this film. Fincher pulls it off. He tries to do way too much. And it was like, oops, you're perfect. You had 48 home runs at the same time. <laughs> but this movie didn't end in the expected way with like a shootout, you know, and oh, oh, I just got that. Oh, yeah. Dirty Harry is in the movie as a thing the cops hate. David, that's pretty on the nose, man. But it's true. The cops in the film watched the turning point in American cinema where the value of entertainment was no longer about due process of the law. It was about killing the bad guy, which is a point we've seen echoed from Fincher multiple times. When Fincher does a serial killer movie, he almost always circumvents the expected ending. In Seven, the killer turns himself in because he needs the cops to kill him. And in Gone Girl, pretty much the entire movie is selling a story about a killer that doesn't exist in the first place, but we're actually hidden from the one that really does. What's funny is the one Fincher film that has the big dumb scene where the villain explains his entire plan is in The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, which was based on a really popular book, but it's a film I find most people consider to be one of Fincher's weakest. It just offers you the least. It's a good Murder mystery. But Fincher is the guy that would sell you a murder mystery and pull a Kevin Spacey rug out from under you. So the next time you watch this movie, put yourself in the shoes of the people in it. Knowing is never enough. We can't be Dirty Harry and just kill a person we think is guilty. People deserve a trial because that's what America is about. But Lee Allen never got his trial. Only when Robert Graysmith painstakingly went through old police files, which he scribbled down out of memory at a nearby diner running back and forth day after day. But only when he did this did anything even come together. I can't imagine a greater way to celebrate a life than to have a Fincher movie made about it. I mean, that's all I want in life. Raise a glass for Robert Graysmith. And this is only one of two films that Fincher has made about real people. You got Zodiac and you got The Social Network. And, well, they're both about psychopaths, only we only... Oh my God, what if Facebook guy is Zodiac boy? And there I go, I sobbed it. And that's an unparalleled honor I would not take lightly. Also, I think Bradley Cooper should play me in the, the, one, about, in the one about me. Yeah. Fincher, get, get Fincher on the phone. Tell him, tell him we got Chipotle coming, if that changes his mind. 
Oh, I'm so glad I finally got to at least touch on this movie. I feel like I could do a whole other episode on Zodiac again because there's just so much more to say. I feel like I barely scratched the surface, though I tried to scratch all over the surface. We kind of got a bit of, of everything going on in this in this very complex, very layered movie. Anyway, thank you guys for all the sharing you've been doing. Thanks to all the new subscribers. The show is definitely still on the uptick as it pertains to growth. So as you can tell, I'm, I'm going a little faster right now because I'm kind of feeding off your energy. That and I just had a shitload of energy because Zodiac and probably all that Chipotle that I ate for lunch that crawled inside my body and died. I feel like it's been a while, probably since Demolition Man, that we've just done a few goofy choices. So I'm going for more levity. The second one, maybe less so. All right, let's go with an Abrams, a Hanson, and a Carpenter. Yeah, I threw big trouble in there because... Why not? As always, if you haven't subscribed, please do. If you haven't shared an episode, please do. Basically, just do whatever you can uh, to help spread the word on the show. Go to moviesmikey.com or follow me on Twitter at MikeyFaceWebs. It's all good. Don't forget to get your votes in. I'll see y'all next time.